Hey there, this is your pal Archie Gamble here, and this is a brand new edition of the Gamble Ramble vlog. In fact, it's a brand new format that I'm trying. Those of you that know me and have subscribed and followed the vlog before know that I have in the fact, uh, in the past rather, in fact, attempted to do this. I believe I started in 2018 or 2019, and I posted several vlogs, and truthfully, I was I'm quite unhappy with how they turned out, and I've removed most of them from this channel. The reason being, of course, is that at the time I was going through a lot of personal issues, a lot of loss and grief, and the deaths in the family and whatnot. And while it may have been a good outlet for me, I found that I was unfocused and uh, tended to ramble. And there's a difference between good rambling and bad rambling, of course. So, as much as I enjoyed vlogging, I, did, I felt that it was just not quite hitting the target. So recently, I, w I was been feeling the, the urge to bring it back in a more concise manner. And uh, as I was looking through some photographs and files recently, it hit me. You know, the old saying came to me that a picture says a thousand words. And I thought about it, you know, looking at these pictures from the, my travels in the past and experiences and touring and recording and thought, yeah, those pictures say more than a thousand words. In fact, some of them have very interesting stories behind them. So that's the format I'm going to try. With your permission, if you take the time to watch, I would appreciate it. I'm going to post a photograph and tell the backstory behind that photograph. And if there's any video evidence of the said uh, story, I will do that as well, included in the vlog. So, for those of you that don't know, I will take a quick second and explain. I'm a musician from Ontario, Canada, a career musician. I've been doing this professionally for over 40 years. I played my first, I'm 55 years old, I played my first nightclub at age 15, and uh, full-time for probably 37 years. And um, it's been a very interesting ride, and I believe I have some interesting perspectives to share, especially, and in particular, with musicians that may want to, younger musicians that are considering this as a, as a uh, career path. Don't. Just kidding. Uh, said that said with tongue firmly planted in cheek. So... To encapsulate that explanation, one of the bands that I played with, the probably the best known band that I played with over the years was a band called Helix, which was a band on Capitol EMI Records. And they were extremely popular worldwide in the 80s. Uh, of course, Canada, and being a Canadian band, was their biggest market, but they did very well in Europe. They had a number one album in Sweden. They toured all through the United States, played at LA Forum, Maple Leaf, uh, Madison Square Garden, Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto. You know, uh, Landover Center and Mentor in Maryland, Boston Gardens, all these legendary venues they played and toured with everybody from Aerosmith to Motorhead to Kiss to Rush. You know, the list goes on. So I was very fortunate to have the experience of playing in the band from 1997. Brian says 1996, I'm not sure, until 2004. And actually, sadly appropriate, today of all days, um, we did just receive news a few hours ago that uh, original Helix drummer Greg Fritz Hines had passed away today, about 2, 2 a.m. this morning, from what I understand. He had a very private bout and battle with cancer for uh, just under a year. And uh, I didn't even know about this, you know, um, but he wanted it that way, he wanted it kept quiet. So um, Fritz was a, a fantastic guy, if you, if you knew him, you would know he was a diamond of a man. He was a great drummer, he was a rock star, you know, a good looking man, a great presence behind the kit, big blonde guy, and just full of life, and an extraordinary person. And I'm so glad that I had the privilege of, of, uh, of being a fan, uh, being a friend, and having a legacy shared together. I was the immediate replacement hire for Fritz when he decided to retire from the band in 97. 196. Um, and there are big shoes to fill, not to mention a big jock strap. Those of you that know uh, Fritz's tendency for wearing a jock strap on stage only will get the, the reference. So, Fritz, you're a diamond of a man and you're loved and missed beyond words. And uh, that all said, I'm going to start this series with a memory and a photograph from the Helix Days. 
Now, I played in many iterations of the band. Um, the One of the last ones was from 2000 to 2002 with my dear friends Sean Sanders, Stan Fountain, and the, and the dearly, dearly departed Dan Fawcett. And so, you know, just thinking about it, it's so sad that we're losing so many people in this crazy world that we live in. And uh, Dan is deeply missed as well. An incredible guitar player and a great guy. So, to begin this properly, I'm going to insert the picture now. Take a look at this photograph. And what do you see? Here's the thousand words behind the photo. This picture was taken in Gander, Newfoundland, Canada, which is an island province off the east coast, off of the coast of uh, Nova Scotia. And uh, they say about Canadians that we're generally a friendly bunch, but they say about Newfies that you'll never meet a stranger. They are absolutely fantastic people, the people of Newfoundland, they're incredible. So the origins of this picture are as follows. We the 2000-2002 lineup of Helix that I described have flown into Gander for uh, one show, but a weekend. So the way it worked was they flew us in the night before the show, and they also gave us a night off afterwards where they uh, promoted paid for hotel rooms so that we could enjoy the hospitality of the people in the town. So... The way this worked was, I was also, during my time with, with Helix, for the last four years, I was tour manager as well, which meant that I took care of a lot of logistics for finalizing contracts with Brian Ballmer and the promoter, uh, booking flights, booking hotel rooms, dealing with the promoters, collecting the pay, making sure that everything was okay so that Brian could go out and do his job, which is being a fucking great rock star. So, uh, <laughs> so one of these duties entailed, as I said, booking flights and getting everyone to the airport on time and so on and so forth. Uh, and in the picture you see, the gentleman in the picture is the promoter for the show that we did. And the show we did was outdoors in a parking lot of, of a mall, a uh, big stage and you know. Now the show wasn't very well attended and what it was supposed to be was a fundraiser for RCMP Search and Rescue. And uh, the gentleman in the picture, unbeknownst to me, I thought he was the promoter, was in fact a member of the RCMP Search and Rescue Squad in Gander, Newfoundland. This tidbit is very pertinent to the story, so please keep it in mind. Now, as we approach the date of the show, it was a summertime date, I think in August maybe, I don't remember the year, between 2000 and 2002. Uh, you know, I booked the flights and got everyone there, uh, made up itineraries for everyone and booked hotels and so on and so forth. And I had a collective email sent to all the members of the band saying, listen, I know what musicians are like. I am one myself. Um, you know, this is pre-legalization of marijuana, which is an important point to make. Please do not feel that you should try to pack any smoky treats in your luggage uh, because of a variety of reasons. A, it's against the law. B, if we had been caught by WestJet, we'd never be able to fly with WestJet again. And WestJet was literally, has kept bands alive in Canada for decades. It's pretty much the only affordable option for, for flying shows and touring. So, it's, you know, I don't want anyone to put us in jeopardy. So what I will do as a tour manager is I will contact the promoter of any city we go to, and if you really need to have your smoke, I will make sure that the promoter knows and he can try and help us. So if you put two and two together by now, I can think you can see where this is going, but I will explain further and in more detail. So come the day of departure, we get rolling into the van and we drive to uh, Hamilton Airport, I believe. We used to fly out of Hamilton. Uh, sometimes there were direct flights from Hamilton that wouldn't go places from that uh, that London, London wouldn't go to, that would go to places London wouldn't go to. Typically, we like to use our home airport here in London, Ontario, but regardless, we flew out, and the flight was uneventful and smooth, and we got to the airport, and uh, there was a gentleman holding a sign, Helix, two gentlemen, actually, if not three, and I went over and introduced myself as tour manager and drummer, and uh, a real, real nice guy. I don't remember the man's name, and it's probably best that I keep his name 
an identity out of this. As you can see by the picture, his eyes and face are blacked out for a reason. So, they were very kind and uh, waiting for us. They had a van, passenger van for the band, and a pickup truck for the luggage and guitars and cymbals, things that we flew in with. When we would do gigs like that, there would be uh, what they call backline provided, drums, amplifiers. Essentially, you just bring your what's in your hands to the gig. And, uh, yeah, we got everything picked up from the luggage carousel. They were as good as gold. They loaded everything, the equipment into the, into the van, got the band in. And if I remember correctly, the Gander Airport was just outside the outskirts of the city, 20, 30 minutes maybe away. So we're driving into town. And I'm having a very pleasant conversation. The guys are in the back, and I'm in the front seat with the promoter. Promoter. And, um, hey, real, real nice guy. I said, you know, how was your flight? And then typical small talk. And I said, yeah, you know, it was great, and blah, 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 blah. And I figured this is probably a good time to bring it up. So I said, well, uh, by the way, you know, a couple people in the band like to partake in, in uh, smoking marijuana. And we didn't want to jeopardize anything by trying to attempting to bring some so you know would you be able to possibly help us find something here now keep in mind i'm speaking to him as tour manager to promoter of the show promoters that promote concerts have seen everything and they've got any request you can think of under the sun has been made of them so 99.9 percent .9 of the time this is the case and i'm thinking it's a typical day but i'll never forget this the gentleman was driving and he's looking straight ahead, and he kind of chuckles. He goes, yeah, you know, I wouldn't be able to help you with that, unfortunately. And I said, oh, that's okay. And he pulled the badge out, opened it up, and he goes, yeah, I'm RCMP. <laughs> now, for those of you that might not be Canadian watching, RCMP is Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which are the famous Mounties that we know of, that they do right, and so on and so forth. But they are a very high-level law enforcement organization. Well, you can imagine how I felt sitting there. And the irony of all this is that I don't even smoke marijuana. Well, not often, but anyway. Um, it, it was actually, in retrospect, very funny because he let it sink in. Very deliberate. And the blood must have drained from my face. I was white as a sheet. Sitting there with my eyes and mouth wide open, not knowing what to say. And he started chuckling. And he said, you know, it's okay. I know what musicians are like. Uh, don't worry about it. It's cool. Really, really super nice guy. And uh, he said, you know, but, you know, you got to be careful who you ask. And it was a lesson learned. And if there's time to end this, I, I will tell a second quick story that also lines up with this one. But So we had a good laugh about it once we realized it was okay. And everyone was kind of chuckling in the back seat, And I was laughing. And uh, this gentleman took us to our hotel. Let him check this in. He and I checked in the band. And he said, listen, we, we've put together a, a welcome barbecue dinner for you guys. So we're going to come back and get you in a couple hours, give you a couple hours to clean up and rest. And I'm uh, going over to my house. I believe it was his house, in the backyard, for some lobster and some steak. He was as good as a bird. He was such a nice guy, as was everyone that we dealt with. So we went back and uh, to the hotel, pardon me. And, you know, and a couple hours later, he picked us up. We went to his home. And he was good as gold. Great. Huge feast. If you know anything about East Coast people, they're hospitable. Probably the most hospitable people in the world. And I uh, had a few drinks and had a laugh. It was a really, really nice time. And I had a, a little stroke of brilliance. I said, you know, I've got this story is too good to not be uh, archived. <laughs> I said, would you mind taking some pictures with me? Uh, pretending you're arresting me. And he got it right away. And to his credit, he laughed his ass off. He said, yeah, that's funny, you know. Now, I can't find the other pictures. There are more pictures in this series. But the picture you see is me on my knees groveling with this gentleman's got his badge out and his handcuffs, I believe. Like he's making like he's going to arrest me. And there was another picture where I'm actually bent over the hood of the car and he's cuffing me. So all in good jest, all in, all in jest, all in good fun, rather. And um, nobody was hurt <laughs> during the taking of this photo. So... There you go, folks. That's just a little a little story for you there. I thought you might get a kick out of one of many interesting and fun things that has happened on the road over the years. And as mentioned, I will attack on a little side story to this that doesn't really have anything to do with Helix, although some of the members of the band were involved. But it's a similar topic, and it happened after the f fact, I believe. So 
a group of friends had gone to Las Vegas for another friend's wedding. And the night before the nuptials, we all went out to this dive bar in Vegas, a very famous dive bar called the Double Down, which is a very cool place. Uh, it's, a, it's a toilet. And literally, they serve these drinks called ass juice. The shot glasses are little ceramic miniature toilets that you drink this stuff out of. It's absolutely horrible and wonderful at the same time. I digress, as I tend to do. Anyway, so this night before the, this friend's wedding, who shall remain nameless, the two friends, we uh, were sitting around at this bar, double down, having a good time, a few drinks, and being the logistics kind of person that I am with most bands I'm in, everyone turned to me and said, hey, we're in Vegas, let's party, you know, what stay, happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? See if you can find us some, uh, well, we'll just say narcotics, illegal narcotics, back in their wild, a long time ago, over 20 years ago, back in our younger, wilder days. So I said, okay, well, I think I can do that. You know, I'm a pretty street smart guy. Don't cough. Anywho, so at the door, there was a doorman, a big, huge, barrel-chested guy, uh, long, silver-gray hair, pulled back a ponytail, big biker beard, biker leather vest on, and, uh, screwed up my courage, and I walked over to the gentleman, and I said, hey, excuse me, uh, you know, uh, I'm here with some friends from Canada, and our friend's getting married tomorrow, we we're hoping to find a little fill in the blanks, and he chuckled, as did the RCMP guy, and he waited for a minute, and he said, yeah, and the, I swear to you, my mother's life, the same thing happened, he pulled out a badge, opened it up, he goes, I'm only a doorman part-time, this is my first time, a uh, full-time job, he worked, he was a sheriff, you know, for the sheriff's department. I don't know if he was an undercover officer or what. And literally, the, all the blood just drained out of everywhere in my body. I felt my, you know, heart go into my ass. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to jail in Las Vegas. Not just jail, but jail in Las Vegas. So it's me right for being stupid, you know. I mean, and the exact same thing happened. He waited a minute to see that I was truly understanding of my dilemma. And that I knew uh, I was a deep shit, potentially. And then he let out a really hearty chuckle. And he said, listen, I don't care. It's Las Vegas. I get it. Be careful who you ask in the future. And I basically groveled, backed away, thanking him. You know, I mean, you know, in my defense, the man looked the exact 180 opposite of, of a police officer. And, uh, you know, so there you go. Fool me once. Shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And uh, you may walk away from the story thinking that I'm not very street smart or whatnot. That's up to you to decide. I beg to differ. I am a human being and mistakes are easily made. So there you go, folks. A little uh, tale from the road. Please, if you can do so, uh, like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, There's something I do for fun, but, you know, it would be nice to build it into something enjoyable and something that, uh, not just enjoyable rather, but something that I could potentially uh, grow. So I really appreciate you taking the time to watch and listen to the ramble and uh, leave comments below, please let me know. Even if you've got a criticism, I'd love to hear it. Thanks for your time and rock you.